Okay, let's begin our session. We will open with a word of prayer. Let's look to God. Our gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, how, Lord, we thank you for this Lord's Day that thou hast given to us, that we may be found in our house to praise and to worship thee. And, Lord, even now as we delve into the topic of Barthianism, Lord, we ask that you would be with us over the next few moments as we study the legacy of this man. We pray, Lord, for wisdom as we go through this together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to call you, Lord, the brave few who were willing to venture here to listen to today's talk. My first encounter with Bath, which remained the first encounter for a very long time, was about 20 years ago. I think I was at a book table, and a friend of mine came up to me, and he pulled out this book that was written by uh, Van Til, the American theologian, and the book was Christianity and Bathianism. And he said, hey, this book is very interesting. You want to read it? So I flipped a couple of pages. I put it down, and I promptly never picked up the topic again until maybe seven months ago when Elder Pinky said, I have a challenge for you. And he said, would you like to speak about Bathianism? I had forgotten at that time what Bathianism was, so I said, sure, I'll do it. And I only realized in the recent weeks what I signed up for. But... It will be very interest- it's been a very interesting study, I must say. Uh, what I've done is I'm going to break this into two sessions. Uh, today will be more introductory in nature, and next week we'll delve a little bit more into the subject matter, the content of what he wrote. So before we begin, I'd just like a bit of audience interaction, if I could call it that. Now, all you have to do is raise your hands. I'll ask you three questions. Huh? Okay. First question. How many of you have heard of Karl Barth? Please raise your hand. Okay, that's going to make the next two questions quite easy because the next question was, how many of these five or six that raised your hand have actually read something about him? Probably the same five or six. Or now left three. Okay, so the other three maybe just heard his name. And of the three who raised their hands, how many of you have actually read something written by him. Okay, this will be interesting. No one raised their hand for the last one. Okay. Now, allow me to begin our session today um, by reading the introduction to Karl Barth from the Princeton Theological Seminary's website. They have uh, what they call a Center for Barth Studies. So Karl Barth was the most important Swiss theologian of the 20th century, with an influence far beyond Switzerland. He is considered alongside Thomas Aquinas, John Calvin, Friedrich Schillenmeier, or Maker, to be one of the greatest thinkers within the history of the Christian tradition. Barth gave new impulses to Protestant theology during a critical phase, reshaping it fundamentally toward a systematic theology that had to cope with the grim realities of the 20th century. I'll expand on this a bit more later. As the principal author of the Barman Declaration, he was the intellectual leader of the German Confessing Church, the Protestant group that resisted the Third Reich. Barth's writings have been translated into nearly every European language, as well as Russian, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, and more. So this is not some random person. There are certainly views held, not necessarily uh, amongst people who share the same views as us, but perhaps of other persuasions who certainly think that this was somewhat of a theological titan, a giant, who lived during the 20th century. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is correct my pronunciation of his name, because it's not Bath, it's actually Bart, like Bart Simpson, Bart. Okay, so not Darth Vader, Bath, but Bart Simpson, Bart. Okay, so Karl Bart is the way, the correct way to pronounce his name. And... If you run a Google search or if you just read material about him, I 
think you're very likely to fall or run into two categories of information or types of material, the either for him camp or the against him camp. That's largely it. It's the for or against him camp. And actually, it's very, very important when you read some material to understand who you're reading. He was a pretty profound person. Um, he wrote a lot of material. And as I said just now, some would regard him as a theological titan. In fact, there was one who went as far as to say, in him, a church father walked amongst us. Now, no matter which side of this divide you fall on, I think there is no denying that he was certainly one of the greatest thinkers of the Christian tradition. And his contribution to theology today cannot be underestimated. Right or wrong, he was certainly a great thinker. And perhaps that, to me, was the challenge that Elder Pinky posed, which was it was simply challenging just to wade through all the material there is about him and to come up with hopefully will be a useful summary to kick off our session today. Now, there's a very real risk that today's first session ends up being a very boring history lesson. I'm very mindful of that, and I'll try my best not to make it so. Um, and I thought perhaps the best way to begin was to explain to you why he even matters in the first place. Why does Karl Barth matter to us? That, by the way, is a real-time cover. He was featured in April 1962 on the cover of Time during his first and only visit to the U.S. Why does he matter? Karl Barth was, as all of us are, a child of our times. And by that, I mean that we are living in the present of where we are. We respond to whatever happens to us at that point in time. And he in all his writings and stuff that we'll discuss, was shaped by these events through and through. He matters because his own experience, whether we agree or not, his own experience was, was one where he chose to take a stand and fight against what he saw to be the evils of his day. He challenged his readers to think critically, to engage with culture. No doubt, challenges of his culture might be different from us today, but the central themes that he wrote about, themes such as the nature of God, the relationship between God and humanity, the significance of Christ, the role of the church in the world, all of these underlying points remain the same and they're relevant to us today. So, how am I going to do this? I'm going to cover Karl Barth in today's first session. There are two sessions, and I'm going to do it over four points, and this is where it's very historical, okay? Firstly, I'm going to go through his early life and education. I'm going to do a quick overview of his academic career. i run through some of his major works, and the bulk of my time will actually be spent going through the major events and influences that shaped his life. Because when we're able to understand this, it puts us in a better position to then take on what's going to happen next week as we delve into his writings and his theology. That picture, by the way, is a commemorative stamp. It's a comm commemorative stamp of the 50th anniversary of the Barman Declaration. Keep that uh, word in your head, okay, that, that, that phrase in your head, the Barman Declaration. We'll come to that later. So, early education of Karl Barth. He was born May the 10th, 1886, in Basel, Switzerland. He was the oldest of five children, older brother to Peter, Heinrich, Katharina, Gertrude. He grew up in a religious household, and he was strongly influenced by his father's theological teachings. His father was um, a preacher and also an instructor in, I think, I didn't write it down here, but I think what's known as the Preacher's College. His father's name was Johann Friedrich Barth, or Fritz Barth, and his mother, Anna Katharina Barth. His mother was the daughter of a conservative minister. 
At a very early age, he showed himself to be uh, a very intellectual and academically able person at a young age. He was one who displayed a lot of intellectual curiosity. In school, he did very well, and he showed a particular interest in philosophy and theology. He began at the University of Bern at in 1904, followed by the universities of Berlin, and I don't know how to pronounce this, I think it's Tübingen, and Marburg. So he went through four universities. And in 1913, he married Nellie Hoffman, who was a member of his first year confirmation class in Geneva, with whom he subsequently had five children, one daughter and four sons. Now, an overview of his academic career, and this is a pretty stellar career um, for a theologian. 1909, so he would have been approximately 23, having completed his uh, studies, he left his final university at Marburg to become an assistant pastor in Geneva, where he remained for two years. In 1911, he moved to a quiet town called Saffenwil in Switzerland, where he was described as a country pastor and where he remained for 10 years. In 1921, he was appointed a full professor of theology at the University of, again, I do not pronounce this, Got Gottingen. And this was following the success and attention that was given to his book, The Epistle to the Romans. Again, we'll talk about this later. In 1925, he served as a professor of theology at the University of Munster in Germany. And in 1930 to 1935, he accepted a professorship at the University of Bonn. 1935 to 1962, he resigned from Bonn in 1935 and returned back to his alma mater, the University of Basel, where he remained until he retired in 1962. Now, these are just dates and names. I fully appreciate that. But for any of you who, I wouldn't go as far as say a history buff, but who are tracking world events, I think you'll become pretty obvious that he was a minister and he was also a theologian and professor at these various universities during a significant time of global upheaval. These dates coincide with World War I and World War II. Okay, we'll come to that. So, moving quickly to the, to the third point. What are some of the major works that he produced now, he was really, really, really a very, very impressive writer. He produced more than 600 works in his lifetime, 600, all of which was in German. So whatever we have in the English language is translated. He never wrote in English. And there was actually a problem with that, and I'll explain later. But perhaps the three that you see on the screen are the ones that gained the most widespread attention. The first I mentioned was the Epistle to the Romans. This was published in 1918. The first edition was published in 1918. And after thinking about it for some time and looking at that significant world event that was happening or had just about concluded around that point in time, he completely rewrote this epistle and he produced a second edition. And these commentaries were unusual. He had a certain style of writing and this we'll, we'll cover a bit more in the second session which um, I think the word is dialectical. Okay, he had a dialectical style of writing, which was basically a style where you um, present two, two extreme points of view and you keep comparing and contrasting them to then bring across the point you're trying to make. So it's actually quite confusing for some people to read, but that was his way of writing. It was very well received, um, and he took the opportunity when he wrote this, this epistle to the Romans to uh, write a very, um, uh, an attack on humanism, which was one of the prevailing thoughts of the day. It was significant because that was a point in time when liberal theology was very much mainstream, and 
many of the conservative ministers who found themselves ill-equipped or perhaps uh, ill-equipped in a sense that they didn't know, hadn't read enough or simply did not have the ability to respond in writing, they found this refreshing, that someone was able to take this position to attack you know, what to them was a very questionable development within theology. Now, the other things that some of these liberal theologians also wrote about was they tried to demean uh, what Christ was and they tried to reduce the Bible really to just an historic account. So taking away, for example, the deity of Jesus, who he is, you know, and all this coincided with the rise of, um, what, can I, what should I call it? The rise of critical thinking the rise of independent thought. And I have a, a short section later on liberal thinking, so we can frame it. But the point is, Romans was written as a response to that. This book was so well received that that is why he, as a country pastor in Saffernville in Switzerland, was suddenly appointed a professor to the University of Gotten, Gottingen in Germany. It was such a well-written epistle that he was invited to take up that position. The um, academia, having recognized the power of his reasoning and his intelligence, invited him to take up that position. Now, the second thing that he wrote then, was Church Dom uh, Dogmatics. Now, it's a four-volume systematic theology, four-volume, but 13 books. He began at the first, he just kept expanding, 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 and all in, he wrote it over a course of approximately 35 years. Now, this is what many describe as his magnum opus. And he said, in his own words, why did he write this? He said, but made it his task to take all that has been said before and to think it through once more and freshly to articulate it anew as a theology of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. You think about it, that was a pretty bold move to take and a massive undertaking. What he was basically saying is that there's all this stuff written, systematic theology. I'm not just going to take it and read it and, you know, just reason with it or accept it. I'm going to take all this stuff, rethink it through again and write this. That was church dogmatics. So all in, 13 books, six million words, 9,300 pages. It was meant to have a fifth volume, which was the Doctrine of Redemption, but it was never written, partly because of age and partly because his assistant at that time was unable to assist any further. Last but not least, the Barman Declaration, and I mentioned that just now. This was writing in, uh, written in 1934. And this was written at a very significant time. Now, World War I had already ended, but this was a time in history in Germany when the roots of fascism, the Nazi influence, was coming into the church. And the Protestant church was struggling very much with it. Not just the Protestant, you know, Lutherans and everyone, okay, was struggling with how do you reconcile what we see happening on a social on a political front with what's happening within our church. And Karl Barth was responsible for writing pretty much most of this. Some will say he wrote the whole thing except for one sentence. I don't know which sentence, but he pretty much wrote the whole thing. And it was a thesis that was called the Theological Declaration of Barman. This declaration was adopted at a meeting of the General Synod of the German Confessing Church in 1934, May 1934, it was attended by representatives from the Lutheran, the Reformed, and the United Churches. And what it fundamentally did in six points was to refute Nazi ideology in very, very clear terms, referring back to the Word of God. And Bart took it upon himself to mail a copy of this to Hitler personally. He never got a reply, but he mailed it to Hitler, all right? And this Barman Declaration became one of the founding documents of the Confessing Church in Germany, which then led the spiritual resistance against National Socialism, which was to come in the years after that. So these are 
just three examples of you know, works they produce, but probably the ones that you find the most amount of material written about. Again, over 600 works were written. There were uh, letters, there were lectures, there were books, there were pamphlets, there were responses, a lot. Like He wrote really, really a lot of stuff. Unfortunately, the majority of it remains in German. So I don't know if there's an ongoing effort to translate it, but the significant ones have been translated. For those of you brave enough to open up one of Bart's writings for yourself, I would say have adequate sleep and bring with you a cup of coffee and probably a pen and a notepad as well because he is not one of the easiest writers to read. I tried and I gave up quite fast. Yeah. It, in my view, he ranks just slightly below John Owen in terms of difficulty of reading. So he is not easy to read, but he has very profound thought in there. So these are three just examples of the major works of, of uh, Karl Barthes. So coming on to the major part of today's session, I wanted to talk about the major events and the influences that shaped Karl Barthes' life. And again, why am I doing this? Because hopefully with an understanding, and there's far more than this, but I just picked out four, these will help inform us as to why he wrote the way he wrote about certain things. Some of you, and I'm thinking of the three people who raised their hands to say that you've actually read something about Karl Barthes, will be familiar with statements like, he said that the Bible is not the Word of God, but contains the Word of God. What does that mean? Well, we'll come to that next week. So, what were the major influences in his life? At a very early age, and uh, his father was a significant influence. So I mentioned that he was raised in a Christian household. His father was a preacher and also a lecturer in the, um, the pastor's college or the College of Preachers. And his mother was also the daughter of a conservative pastor. So he was raised in this household where there were strong teachings. His father took the additional step of supervising his education. And by that, I mean directing where he was to study. Now, at this point in time, and we're talking about the late 1800s, the early 1900s, what was in vogue? Liberal theology. It was the big thing. Liberal theology was in vogue, and Carl wanted to go to a university that would give him that liberal Protestant education. And thankfully, by God's grace, his father intervened and said, no, 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 cannot. That's not good, all right? And um, in the end, he went to Basel. He took, uh, I think these are kind of like pre-university exams or something like that. He wanted to go to a more liberal university but at the end of the day, after debating with his father, he ended up in kind of a middle ground university, which was in Berlin. And I mentioned just now, he also went to two further universities. There's a lot of history tied up with that, including um, uh, a lady with whom he had an interest in and was no longer allowed to see her, so he had to change university. Then after that, he went to another university. Too much detail for the purposes of this, but that goes a little bit to explaining how he ended up in four universities. But key point here, the family environment in which he grew up in, the influence of his father, Fritz Bart, was significant at a very young age to kind of steer him you know, as he was kind of pottering down this path of liberal theology, trying very much to get into it. The next significant influence for Karl Barth was really the academic environment in which he found himself in. Now, as much as his father sought to not let him have that full-on liberal theological type of education, it was everywhere. It was just a question of how, like, how, how very liberal that particular university was versus maybe he's a little bit less liberal. But like it or not, he ended up sitting under very famous liberal theologians of his day. A, a couple of names I, I don't expect anyone to know, but I'll just read them out anyway. So one was this person known as Ad, uh, Adolf von Harnack, okay? That was one. Another person was Friedrich, um, uh, that's saying just now, Schiller maker. And the last name, but not least, is Willem Herman. Now, Willem Herman is an interesting name. Now, all these are three liberal theologians of the day, but why is Willem Herman interesting? Willem Herman was also at one point the teacher 
Audrey Gresham Machen. And we know who that is, right? Founder of Westminster Theological Seminary and also the founder of the Orthodox Presbyterian Churches in the US. So one that we consider to be sound. But he spent one year under William Herman as well. So what happened during this time, this academic environment was that Karl Barth goes off to Berlin, he studies, he comes back and he's you know, conversing with his parents and his parents realize that, goodness, my son has become this super liberal theologian. And they kind of sent him off to study at this other university I mentioned just now, Tübingen, Tübingen right? so that he'll have a bit less influence of the liberal theology. Again, there was that lady that I talked about that was mixed up in all the history. But finally, at the end of it, <coughs> he ended up in Marburg under William Herman. And interestingly, Bart would say later on in, in his life that at that point of time in his life, William Herman was his greatest teacher. He learned the most from him. But he was to become later on in his life one of the greatest critics of William as well. So at this moment, I'm going to pause because I keep throwing out the word liberal theology. What is liberal theology? What was this influence that's happening in Germany? And in fact, it was not just in Germany. It was something that had been happening for 100, 200 years already. It was happening in Germany. It was happening in the US. You see, liberal theology coincided with effectively a renaissance of thinking, of knowledge, of education. When men felt that for themselves, they could kind of discover God through reason. So there's a very strong emphasis on human reason in, in, in liberal theology that, hey, if I sit down and if I reason and think about it long enough, if I rationalize it, I can, in fact, discover God and understand scripture. That was one tenet of liberal theology. Another aspect of it was that liberal theology emphasized human progress. Man gets better. Over time, man does not get worse, but with the growth of knowledge, with the growth of understanding, with reason and intellect and all that, surely man must become better because we know more things, right? We discover more things, we invent more things, and if I, ex if I export that kind of thinking into theology, we will become better. And therefore, human, humans themselves will progress over time. And very critically, they said that not only can humans improve themselves socially, but also morally. And when I put that word in, I think a lot of you will think, mm, that's interesting, right? Can man improve himself morally? Well, we're all sinners, are we not? But liberal theology said, no, you can improve yourself morally. Liberal theology also sought to downplay supernatural things and miracles. So what they tried to do is, okay, this thing happened in Scripture, clearly a supernatural thing. Jesus was able to transform water into wine. No, actually, there is a scientific explanation for that. Oh, there was a parting of the Red Sea, no, it wasn't a sea, it was actually a very shallow seabed and then there was a lack of rain or something like that, right? That's what liberal theology again tried to do. You want to say, you know, these things you call miracles, the intervention of the supernatural being, no, no, no it didn't really happen. There is a natural explanation for that. And perhaps most importantly, Liberal theology sought to relativize scripture. What do I mean by that? Actually, scripture is not the word of God. Scripture is the product of culture. Scripture is a product of history. Man, at that point in time, a thousand, two thousand years ago, wrote because of these things that are happening. There was this miraculous man called Jesus who was there. He seemed like a prophet of sorts and all that, and it was written like that. But this is not something that God had input on. Rather, it was a collection of human writings. There was no such thing as the inspiration of Scripture by God. It was man's writings. And naturally, with this, the centrality of Christ went away. Because it's all about man. It was all about intellect. It was all about knowledge 
and development. That was liberal theology. And I took a moment just to explain this because it was interesting for me. I had actually forgotten what liberal theology was when I was preparing for this message. And when I read this again, I was like, yes, does that not happen today? And for many of us, do we not try to reconcile what we see in Scripture with what's happening today? The challenges, as I said just now, in Bart's time are different from the challenges that we face today. But the challenges that we face today, are we not, do we not sometimes try to rationalize it away? I'll throw a few things out for you. The creation account, LGBTQ and all that. Those are what faces us today, right? How do we respond to that? Think about it. I think there is that relevance over there. Now, what's the third influence on Karl Barth's life? He had so-called the change of mind event, which he wrote about in a particular book. And he moved into what's known as neo-orthodoxy, and just now I used the dialectical theology. Now, very briefly, neo-orthodoxy is a term that is commonly associated with Karl Barth, but interestingly, rejected by him personally, that I'm not neo-orthodox. But he will accept that he was described as a dialectical person. I find it very hard to explain what neo-orthodox is, so I won't, okay? I'll just go into the history of all this. And for those of you who are interested, please just go read it yourself, because this stuff is all pretty deep, even from my point of view. Now, coming back again, the change of mind, neo-orthodoxy, dialectical theology. When Bart was in Saffinville, and this was his 10 years as a country pastor, this was the first time that he had the whole pastor job to himself, right? He was, before this, assistant pastor in Geneva, and I made the point because he was supporting someone, but it was really in Saffinville that he had the opportunity to run his own uh, pastorate. His first opportunity to say, well, all these things that I learned in university, let me see, how am I going to apply this to my congregation. And what was in his mind? Liberal theology. How am I going to apply all these different things I now know about God through reasoning, through rationalism? How am I going to apply all this to my congregation? And he actually, in this period of time, became a very outspoken candidate for what is known as democratic socialism. I'm not a politics student, so I just copied this definition in case you guys don't know what it is. Is political ideology that supports the establishment of a democratically run and decentralized form of so socialist economy. Whatever, right? This whole idea that he was trying to promote this in his own area, amongst his own members, in this village that he lived in. So much so, he was so activist about this, he was so outspoken about this, he actually was known loosely, and look this up, as the Red Pastor Saffronville. He was colored by it. He was associated with that color. However, it was also during this time in Saffronville, 1911 to 1921, that we all know that World War I happened, right? 1914 to 1918. Now, what did liberal theology promote? It promoted reasoning. It promoted intellect. And one of its tenets was that it promoted developments and human progress. Man will become better socially and morally. Now you try to reconcile that type of teaching of theology with the horrors of what Karl Barth witnessed during World War I. And you can start to see that this would have crumbled very quickly. If we're talking about human progress, if we're talking about development and all that, how could an event how could the horrors of World War I happen? Now, there's a lot of history behind that, but when I think of World War I, I think of trench warfare. I don't know if you guys think the same thing. It was brutal. It was literally down to the number of people you had and charging the enemy front line. But behind that was ideology and all that. And if liberal theology was correct, how could something like World War I happen? And this was a thing that was happening and brewing in Bart's mind. I learned this in uni, but I cannot reconcile this to what I see happening around me. 
And this was also the catalyst for why he then wrote the epistle to Romans. In 1914, there was a public statement of support that was written in support of the then Kaiser's war policy. It was signed off by 93 intellectuals. And amongst the 93 were several of Bart's teachers, lecturers, people, men that he had respected in the course of his academic development. And when he realized that his teachers who had been promoting this teaching could sign such a document, it just, you know, he was totally dismayed and he made a decision at that point after reading that public declaration that he could not follow the teachings of his former teachers anymore. During his time in Saffernville, I need to look this, I didn't have a chance to actually look it up, like where exactly this village is, because it sounded very, very Ulu. <laughs> Why do I say that? He was in Saffernville and he needed fellowship because he was actually having a very difficult time. He, can you imagine this young man? So, how old is he? 11. He was about 26, 27, just married, kids are coming out and all that. He's trying to teach his somewhat radical teachings to all of his, uh, his, his, his members, his congregation and all that. And it was not going down very well, quite honestly. People were resisting this, this, this uh, young upstart, if I could call him that. And he found support in a friend who was a pastor in a church that was a half an hour drive away. I didn't write down the town it was, but his friend's name was called um, Edward uh, Thunison. And these two people throughout his 10 years in Saffernville, struck up a strong and what was to become a lifelong friendship. But the same two people were the ones who then experienced this disillusionment with liberal theology. And when that public statement I wrote about, that was signed by 90, 93 people, was published, they both realized that cannot really. We can't follow this anymore. And they set upon themselves this task to relook and to restudy scripture against the prevailing tide of liberal theology that day. In Edward's words, we read the Bible in a new way. We read it more respectfully, more as an external word addressed to us in our time. We criticized it less. We read it with the eyes of shipwrecked people who all had gone overboard, overboard liberal theology. The Bible appeared in a new light. So mark this moment, because this moment is very important for next week's session. This marks the beginning of how he starts thinking. And in Bart's words, in place of liberal theology, he argued that the church needed a vision of God that was wholly other. Stop this trying to infuse Bible and scripture and everything is whatever is happening in the world in liberal theology. God is greater than that. He is wholly other. He transcends. He is way beyond the realm of human experience. He cannot be reduced to what humans want to describe him. And it was this kind of thinking that would then lead to the Bible. It's not the Word of God, but contains the Word of God. I'll try to explain that next week. But what he said was that even God in deciding whether to reveal himself to ordinary humans will only do it very, very slightly. He says, as a tangent touches a circle, okay, a geometry reference, but that's how God would choose to reveal himself. This is what he wrote in his epistle to Romans. He will only reveal himself on his own terms because that's the sovereignty of God. Sounds correct, right? Yeah. And if it was anything less than that, if it was anything less than God revealing himself to humans, on his own terms, this would establish this linkage between God and his creatures by which God would lose his transcendence whereby human beings could manipulate or control God and bend him into modern, into categories of modern thought. Now, a lot of heavy words in there, but you can see the liberal theology resistance in that language. Why? because liberal theology had done exactly that. They were translating, manipulating, controlling God of the scripture into what they wanted him to be. 
to rationalize him away or however they wanted to rationalize him. They wanted to say and they wanted to adapt God and scripture to what was current, to what was modern, to what pervading knowledge of that time was. And in so doing, that was the era of liberal theology. So that's why, and then Bach, when he wrote later on his books, you know, dialectical theology and all that, contradictory type of statements, that's the way he wrote. Last but not least, and <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll close off with, with this thought, the final influence uh, for Karl Barth, and that was World War II. His role in the German Confessing Church and its ex expulsion from Germany. So, in 1930, and this was just before uh, the significant rise of fascism, Barth was then invited to Bonn, where he was to be the chair of systematic theology in the University of Bonn. He was there for a rather short time. He was there only for five years, 1930 to 1935. He was expelled in 1935. But it was actually during these five years that his most mature theological writings you know, and thinkings dawned upon him. During these five years, he would see the rise of power of Nazi Germany. He would write the first volume of his church dogmatics and draft the Barman Declaration and at the end of it, he'll be forced to leave Nazi Germany. So he actually went to Bonn and he was starting to write his church dramatics, right? So remember, he's on this kind of like mission, right? He said this enlightenment, he said this change of mind. So he says he cannot agree with liberal theology anymore. And after he leaves Saffronville, he goes to, it, uh, I forget the name now, but the other university where he was there uh, for a while. Um, and he starts to write all these things where he's trying to refute liberal theology and he's on his mission, I want to write more about it. But actually in 1930 when he went to Bonn, this mission or this focus they had was somewhat derailed because of the rise of Nazi Germany where he saw that there was an existential threat to the church itself in the form of Nazism or fascism that was coming in. Now, what was the problem? The problem was that Hitler and those around him were trying to bring the church into the realm of the state. And he wrote several things. Well, Barman Declaration we talked about. But before that, in 1933, he also wrote this book called Theological Existence Today, where he was trying to resist and say, look, Nazi ideology, you do not belong within the church. And he protested in his writings in different ways. In fact, some say that his protests against the Nazis was probably the most significant and influential protests made by a Christian theologian within Nazi Germany. Some of the more well-read ones will go, hey, wait, wait, hang on. How about, you know, people like uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and all that? Okay, fine, yes, but Dietrich was actually German. Bart was Swiss. Bart was this guy living in Germany who was protesting against it. And look, between these two people, very few match the level of writing and resistance that they provided against the rise of Nazism. Now, how did it all come late? How did it all come together? Basically, Hitler and those around him were trying to somehow, and this is also liberal theology as well, huh? you can see all this coming together, were somehow trying to bring into the church the thinking that, look, Actually, whatever the state is doing is fine, is legal, and you, as the church, have to support this. And actually, this is how we explain it, whatever those writings were. But that was the idea, so that when you look at a church in Germany at that point in time and their leaders, they would be wholeheartedly supporting whatever the regime was doing. That also explains the earlier statements signed quite a while ago, 10, 20 years ago, by the 93 people, you know, trying basically to bring across, across entire society, the idea that everyone supports what's happening in Nazi Germany. And this manifested in what was known as the Oath of Loyalty. In 1935, Hitler made every senior military person, or actually maybe every military person, individual, as well as every civil servant signed an oath of loyalty to him. 
but as a minister and as a professor at university, was considered a civil servant. And the, civ and the oath of loyalty read this, I swear I will be faithful and obedient to the leader of the German Empire and people, Adolf Hitler, to observe the law and to conscientiously fulfill my official duties. So help me God. Bart refused to sign this. He absolutely refused. Well, he, he said, I'll sign now, but I must put one qualification. He's something along the lines of his conscience or something. I said, I'll sign it if I can add this little phrase in at the back. Of course, the regime said, no, you're going to sign it in its current form. You can't add anything to it. So on the 1st of March, 1935, the Gestapo marched over to Bart and they served him with a total ban on public speaking. They said, you can't speak anymore. Bart gave his final sermon on March the 26th in the church in Sagan, and immediately after that sermon was preached, he was escorted out of Germany. Remember, he's not a German citizen, right? Born in Switzerland, so he's escorted out of Germany, and thereafter resigned from his post in the university, and he returned back to the University of Basel, where he then remained until 1962. So, this is really just a touch, an introduction. Now, after this, Bart also engaged in a few other controversies. There's some writings on baptism, natural theology, and there's a lot to go through. Next week, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pull a couple of things. I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about this. Is the Bible the Word of God, or does it contain the Word of God? Because that's probably the most common criticism you have of him. If you want to read more, I mentioned the book that Van Til wrote, Christianity and Barthanism. You know, there's quite a lot inside there. A firm supporter of Bart says that book was totally uh, below the belt and unfair. Why? Because Bart, as you remember, wrote in German. So whatever stuff that was exported to the English-speaking world, the Anglophile world at that point in time, was all translations, right? And unfortunately, Around this time that he was escorted out of Nazi Germany, all his translations into English pretty much ceased for, I think, almost two decades. So Ventil was arguably arguing against someone who could not respond to it because there was no way to do the to and fro thing. So, you know, read it with that perspective as well. Now, he made, he finally made a visit to the US in 1962. And he went around several you know, churches and theological seminaries. His, one of his sons was actually a professor in one of the seminaries there. And by this point in time in 1962, just a few years before his death, he had written mountains of material. And someone raised up a hand in the middle of one of his lectures and just said to him, look, you've published millions of words, hundreds of publications. Can you summarize the essence of everything that you've written. Can you summarize that for us in a sentence? And Bart thought for a while, he just said, it's very simple. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's what he said. So, where does that leave us at the end of today's session? As one writer put it, Karl Barth was a theological titan whose thoughts, although complex and often elusive, roared through the theological world of the 20th century like a tsunami. And so next week, we will look at some aspects of this tsunami. Hopefully, I'll be prepared by then. I'm still working through it. But I hope that it will be interesting. It will be useful for all of us. And again, I would reiterate that I hope this wasn't a history lesson for all of you. I hope it was interesting. But most importantly, it is relevant. Why? Because, yes, we could go into what Bart said about this and that, but it was really what Bart was trying to do, standing against the evil of his time, writing against it, trying to bring the relevance of Scripture to the modern developments and controversies of his time. We have ours today. And yes, that's why he's relevant. That's why he's important to us today. So... That was about 50 minutes, okay. I have one minute. Does anybody want to ask questions?
I didn't really mean it. No? Okay, fine, sure. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thanks, Joel. Um, yeah. I got two questions. The first sure. one relates uh, is a bio biographical one. The second one relates to something that you said earlier. Uh, and the first question is: uh, Is there anything that we read about Bart's conversion to Christ, uh, or what can we possibly glean about this event uh, from the writings, from his writings on his soteriology? Uh, the second question is re relates to something you said earlier about how people for usually divide themselves into for and against. Are there common characteristics uh, of both groups? And you know, who, who are these people that are for and who are the people who are usually against? Thanks. Um, so the first question about his conversion experience, thanks for the question. Interestingly, I didn't read anything about it uh, in all the stuff I was reading, not, nothing specific. Almost 99% of the material is actually very much focused on his writings and you know, his, 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 uh, his Bathianism, so to speak, and all that. But th I'm sure there must be something because there's really a lot of stuff on him. I've only really, really barely scratched the surface. Now, to the two uh, theological camps, the for and against, um, you know, someone asked me just now when I was standing downstairs uh, 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 guiding the cars uh, as you all were just getting off. Someone yelled to me, so, is Bart reformed? <laughs> that was the question that was asked. And my response was, uh, I don't feel equipped to answer that question yet. And the guy next to me was like, of course he's not reformed. Okay? But then that, st that same guy who's not here, and I'm not going to say who it is, and the two guys next to me, so you can't guess who it was, right? The same guy, I also asked, have you read anything from Bart before? And the guy said, no, not yet. All right? But that gives you an idea of how much there is out there criticizing or supporting. There really is a lot of stuff out there about him. What do they agree on? I think they agree that he really was a thinker, a very, very deep thinker. Whether you want to use the word theologian, okay, like I can call him theologian now, but whether you agree with his theology is another thing, but many agree that he actually was a theologian and a well-written theologian, but there are disagreements with certain positions that he's taken. All will agree that he sought to be Christ-centric, that he wanted to bring back the significance of the word in its inspired form again to Christians because liberal theology had pushed away a lot of that. So I think these are things where you'll find that I think both camps will agree on. What they won't agree on is the final outcome of whatever uh, he wrote about. Elder Pinky sent me a link to this book six months ago and he said you might want to read this. I got a copy last week, um, and I'm still working through it, but this is interesting because this is a book of, I think, about 12 to 15 essays where they engage on Bath on a variety of topics that he has written about, and there are a lot of leading names theologians over here. So if anything, it was worth their time, and it was worth their responding to. Um, what I hope by the end of next week's session is maybe to draw out, you know, what were some of what people say were the errors in his thinking and to contrast that against our position, you know, in our church as a, as a, as a reformed church. Look, some people say he was reformed. Some people say he was not reformed. Some people say he was neo-orthodox. He said himself he was not neo-orthodox, you know. There is a lot about Bart out there that's quite honestly quite confusing. And as one writer put it in one of the essays inside here, the problem with Bart is that so many people came to form views on him without even reading his stuff. They just wrote what other people wrote about him. And why? Because it's not easy to read. They wrote what people uh, wrote about his position on certain things. And that actually became one of Bart's own protests later in life. He said, look, disagree with me, fine. But understand why I wrote the thing. Go to the underlying logic of how I reached it. Don't just take the final point and disagree with that. Bart himself said that as well. So, I don't know. I think I feel like I've opened that chasm even bigger right now. There's even more insight there. But he really, I think, you know, there really is a lot going on over there. Um, okay, yeah. So, anyway, I hope that was a, hope, uh, a useful first session. There's a bit of a teaser. Next week, we'll pick up a couple of themes um, in his writings. Okay, let's close our session with a word of prayer.
Our Lord, our God, we thank you again for the past hour that we're able to spend some time and to look into Barthianism. Lord, we pray that even through our study of his life and his writings, that Lord, you'll be pleased to guide and to instruct us in your word and in what is right. We will commit the rest of this Lord's day into thy hands, that Lord, you may bless us in our use and our service of thee in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.